So he came back to London and he has this spectacular overnight success, both financially and, and socially and, and uh, publicly, and is immediately thrown into the circle of the most powerful people in England, the most powerful people, one of whom is the Prince Regent. Right here you see him, and so he is running England uh, from behind the scenes. Young man, going to be king, but at this moment not king, and living a very, very fast, sexy, uh, secret life of liaisons and girlfriends and, and all kinds of things going on, and, and all of it quite dangerous because he's about to be head of state. He is head of state, but he's, he's not yet head of state. He's going to be King George IV soon and rule for about 15 years. There's Thomas Lawrence's portrait of him as king. Now, that's one of the people who's going to be in Byron's circle here. Remember, Byron is, is nobody in this when he comes back from the trip. Nobody knows particularly. They just know he's Lord Byron. Then the other person, and I'm going to mention a number of them to you uh, to show you how really instantly Byron enters into the very highest, most powerful circles, is this wonderful, interesting, delightful, great, interesting woman that if you ever read a book about her, you're just going to love it. Elizabeth Lamb, uh, the Lady Melbourne, Viscountess Lady Melbourne, uh, who becomes Byron's closest friend at this moment in his life. He just meets her at a party. They're introduced, and they like each other immensely. Uh, she's an, you know, an older married lady, 1751, so she's uh, 30 years older, so a motherly kind of figure. So uh, Elizabeth Lamb becomes kind of a, a London mother, and they just adore each other. And so they become constant companions with constant letters back and forth. So Elizabeth Lamb, Lady Melbourne, becomes his very, very dear closest friend, and, and we have their letters, and there are a lot of them. I mean, and of course, they just tell you every, everything about what's happening. Now, the next person he meets is the most famous of his many affairs. He had almost yearly annual affairs, but his, his affair with Lady Caroline Lamb was so shocking and so over the edge and out of the park and over the fence and whatever other image you can think of that to this day it remains the most famous of the many ladies who fell in love with him. Lady Caroline Lamb was First of all, the daughter-in-law of Lady Melbourne, whom you just met. Lady Caroline Lamb is married to Lady Melbourne's son. And Charles Lamb is about to be prime minister of England. So Byron is playing around with very powerful people. These people have this morning breakfast party I just told you about. And at the party are many of these people, including Lady Caroline Lamb, Annabella Milbank, who will be Byron's wife, and Lady, and, and, and Lady Caroline Lamb said, everybody was talking about Byron. Everybody was talking about Byron. And she couldn't wait to meet him. She'd never met him. And so now for the next uh, few weeks, every single friend she has is pumped for information. Oh, did you meet him at this party? Oh, tell me everything about it. And so all of London soon was waiting for the meeting between Lady Caroline Lamb and Lord Byron. So finally, finally, they met at a party. And so here in he walked, and Lady Caroline Lamb about fainted <laughs> and instantly went to him and did not let go. That is, for months and months and months from now on, from the party, Immediately, they saw each other the next day, and every day successively for months and months and months. And everybody in London was talking about the affair between Lady Caroline Lamb and, and, and Lord Byron. Now, you can imagine what Lady Melbourne was thinking and what the regent was thinking and everybody else was thinking, because this was the wife of Charles Lamb, the future prime minister. And so now began... A about a six-month love affair between the two of them uh, where uh, everybody in London talked about nothing other than Byron and Lady Caroline Lamb. So now began the scandal of Byron and Lady Caroline Lamb. After about six months, he'd had enough because she was everywhere. She would show up on her own if she thought he was going somewhere else. And so he tried to break it off but she was not about to have it broken off. 
And so even after he told her it was over, she would show up at events to which he was coming. One was a very famous ball with hundreds and hundreds of people there. And she swept into the middle of it on her own because he was there with, it with someone else. And she made a scene out in the middle of the floor. And so um, he took her out to the front door to try to get her to go home and she wouldn't and so he had to just push her into this carriage and get someone else you know to drive her home and get her out and of course everybody in London was talking about it, it was such a scene such a public scene in the middle uh, this went on and on and on um, until uh, both mother-in-law and husband and friends intervened and uh, got her out of London and tried to to calm her down. Now, now the next person enters the story. Annabella Milbank. Uh, Annabella Milbank was the niece of Lady Melbourne, and uh, Annabella had been at the same party that Caroline Lamb came to and met Byron. They were very good friends, and the two girls had been chatting and gossiping about Byron before the party. And Caroline, of course, was saying she was going to get her hands on him. She was going to get him. You know, she was going to get him. And uh, Annabella was just listening and listening and listening. And sort of she was a very mild, sweet, wonderful thing. Uh, and so she kept quiet. But secretly, she fell in love with him too. Now, another lady enters the picture. Uh, at just this moment, 1813, when he was at his supreme f f uh, fame from uh, Child Harold's pilgrimage, Augusta Byron Lee re-entered his life. She came to London to see him. She was his half-sister. And they had had almost no contact in their entire lives. She was living someplace else, growing up somewhere else. Then he grew up, then he went to Cambridge and all. But now, here they were in 1813, both of them in their 20s. Uh, she was married. Her last name was Lee, L-E-I-G-H. And she came to London to meet her half-brother, her famous, her very, very famous half-brother. Uh, and so she had business in London. She was actually a member of the Queen's Court. So she was one of the ladies in waiting. So she had an appointment at court. She had had important people help for this. Uh, and she and her husband, they needed the money because that, that gave you an income. And so she had reason to be in London. So she arranged to meet her famous brother, after this, you know, 20 year separation. And they met and fell madly in love. She was absolutely devastatingly beautiful, but in a female way, exactly the way he was, with this gorgeous raven hair falling down around her shoulders, beautiful, beautiful eyes, spectacular profile, which you can see in the painting. And so you can imagine what they thought when they saw each other. <laughs> oh my God, you're the, you're the male me. Now, of course, they didn't think of themselves as incest because they hadn't seen each other for their whole lives and they weren't, you know, brother, sister, really, they were only half. But everybody else in London did, let me tell you. Everybody else in London did. And so when the new story of Augusta and, and her brother began to appear, uh, Lady Melbourne became very concerned uh, because she knew that at this point uh, Byron had one major enemy on the planet, her son, <laughs> the next prime minister. So uh, Lady Melbourne knew everything that was happening in London, and she knew that there was danger for Byron at this point, because now, um, now the, this relationship with Augusta was becoming uh, somewhat shocking to, to the society, and she had a sense that they might turn on him and she knew there was danger. During this period of 1813 to 14, uh, Lady Melbourne encouraged Byron to correspond with Annabella. Uh, that was her niece. And what she was doing was encouraging them in a, as a couple because she kind of hoped something might happen because she thought Annabella would give him respectability. And so during 1813 to 14, the two of them just wrote to each other. Annabella was a brilliant woman, brilliant education. Their daughter it, it was a brilliant woman. So they were both brilliant, and her letters were magnificent. And Byron fell in love with her letters. He just, he just thought, oh my God, I just love this letters. I'm going to marry this woman. So out of this correspondence came this somewhat bizarre idea that he would go up to North 
County and uh, visit with her parents and propose to her. In 1815, he went to Durham, up in the north, and met her parents, uh, Lord and Lady Milbank, uh, and they hated his guts. Everything about him said, too handsome, too sexy, too unrestrained, too many affairs, too many other women, and not the right kind of guy to marry my daughter, who they knew was very simple and very sweet and very virginal and you know inexperienced. But uh, Byron was so determined that this woman had written these beautiful letters and that they were perfect because he wrote all the time and she had written these wonderful letters, so that must be a good reason to get married. He, he was also being encouraged in it by Lady Melbourne because she was scared that he was going to be arrested or something. She was afraid of what the political thing was going to do uh, when he had, he had violated every rule. You know, he had, he had half a dozen women that he'd slept with, who, all of whom had husbands, and all of whom were getting mad. So she thought if he could just get married, settle down, that uh, everything would be better. And so they got married. They got married. January uh, 18... 15.